All right, let's get started with the second part of the day. Um, I'm actually going to try to move forwards the times for this panel um, by a couple of minutes so that we can hopefully get out a little bit early and or have more time for discussion uh, with the panel. I know no one ever objects to leaving early, right? Uh, so before I lead into this next part, um, I do just want to make a quick uh, acknowledgement of our um, inaugural NIDA and EMF grantees. Um, this was an announcement that was supposed to be made by Jeremy Brown, but again, he couldn't be here because of that darn shutdown. Um, so we actually have two of our three um, NIDA EMF grantees here in the audience, and I would like to ask them to stand. Um, Lauren Whiteside. <laughs> from, hey, Lauren. from University of Washington. She was awarded um, a grant to develop, to, excuse me, for validation of a risk prediction screening tool for prescription opioid misuse using health information technology in an ED sample. Um, thanks, Lauren. Good luck. <laughs> Uh, next is Monica Watana. Her study is entitled Pilot Validation of an Opioid Misuse Risk Measure for Emergency Department Patients with Cancer. She's at MD Anderson. And third is Francesca Bowden, who is from my shop but couldn't be here today because she has midterms for her master's. Um, and her award is titled Validation of Assessment of Prescription Opioid Use and Misuse Tool in Older Emergency Department Patients. So I really, again, want to thank NIDA and EMF for funding these awards and look forward to the results of all three uh, grants. So on that note, uh, the, moving on to our panel about uh, screening and brief intervention for substance use disorders. Obviously, we ended up the last panel with a lot of discussion on this topic. Um, we know that we as emergency physicians serve as the uh, most common and often the only point of contact for patients with substance use disorders, not just opioids, but a variety of other substances as well. And we know from the work that a lot of you guys have done that we provide a critical opportunity to detect and intervene with substance use problems. But we're not doing it. Um, so in this panel, we're going to talk about why we should be doing screening and intervention, who we should be doing it for, and how to handle people with dual diagnoses with co-occurring mental health disorders. And then we're going to talk about some technology-based solutions for implementing this more effectively. We'll then follow up with a real-world panel similar to what we had during the opioid section of the talk. Um, and throughout, we're going to have a lot of opportunity for questions and answers. Um, so I am honored to be able to introduce these three speakers because they are all mentors of mine. Um, so first we're going to start with Gail D'Onofrio, who is Chair of Emergency Medicine at Yale and uh, a wonderful researcher. So there she is. Okay, good afternoon. So I have a lot of information. I think you've got it in your handouts. Did you get the slides? Yes, okay, so I'm not going to go over everything, but I gave it to you um, to look at later. And uh, as you know, the 2012 National Survey on Drug Use and, and Health is for Americans over the age of 12. So we know that a lot of people drink and binge. We know that a lot of people use illicit drugs. We know that a lot of people meet uh, DSM criteria and need treatment, and very few uh, receive it. And so you know why the emergency department, uh, given the rates of high comorbidities that you'll hear more about, you'll see that individuals with substance use disorders often present more likely to the emergency department than other places. Um, and so we have a great opportunity to intervene. Uh, these are SAMHSA slides, which is uh, SBRT is defined by them as a comprehensive integrated public health approach, the delivery of early intervention for individuals with risky alcohol and drug use and timely referral to more intensive substance abuse treatment. And I'm going to talk also today that I think this is kind of varied because I think that it's not just for people with early intervention for risky use, but could be used for people all along the spectrum. And um, we have thought of this um, at Yale with Dr. Bernstein and myself more as in STIR, screening, treatment, initiation, and referral, because it can be used for anybody along the spectrum. And we should be seeing and uh, intervening with all of those patients. So why should we do this? There is evidence, I'll talk to you a little bit about it, that, that alcohol um, and drug misuse does uh, work with uh, screening intervention, does work to improve it and improve the health of the public. 
And we know that the SBIRT works um, and reduces health care costs. Certain studies have shown that investing in SBIRT can result in health care cost savings that can range anywhere from $3.80 to $5.60 for each dollar spent. This referred to Gentilil and Fleming. And we also know that SBIRT cost benefits from a uh, employees' perspective are very important. And a 2010 study showed that, um, indicated that when you have absenteeism and prepared, I've never heard of this word before, the study of uh, uh, presenteeism, presentism, which means you were there, you actually present, <laughs> you're not absent, um, caused that the net value of SBIRT adoption was $771 per employee. So remember that substance um, abuse is a really big problem for major big employers, and so they are also interested in anything that we can do. SAMHSA defines all of this comprehensive model in, in SBRT as brief, can be as little as five to ten minutes if you're in the ED setting and can be longer if you do be brief treatment. That screening is universal. Um, one or more specific behaviors related to alcohol and drug use can be targeted. And these services are occurring at public health really in a non-substance abuse treatment center and that's what probably most uh, rings true to all of us and that we are non-substance abuse treatment. Um, it can be comprehensive and that there is some strong research and experimental evidence that supports their, this effectiveness. And as you can see, uh, this is a slide I stole from um, Tom McClellan, is the pyramid of substance use that there's a lot that have little or no use, but that uh, 68 million Americans, basically we need to focus on early use. Addiction accounts for about 25 million and those that are in treatment are only a fraction of that. So if we can somewhere along the way either stop the course or get people into treatment, we can do a great job in improving the health of the public. Um, in terms of uh, SAMHSA and others that we think that if you identify people that are low risk, there's really no further intervention. If you are uh, also, and I think in the adolescent literature, or for those of us who sing young adults, then we might say, well, we just kind of reinforce that's a great thing that you're not drinking or using drugs, and it's, so it's not really no further, it's just reinforcing good behavior. And moderate use, we can do a psychosocial intervention, moderate to high, may need to be referred or um, to more extensive treatment or to more, uh, I would call boosters in primary care. And those that are in this severe dependent um, range need to be referred for specialty treatment and then the goal of the intervention is really purely to get them to accept a treatment referral. It's not that you can change their drinking or drug use in five seconds. So there are a lot of screening tools for alcohol and alcohol has been measured very clearly and you can use any of them that you want. I prefer certain than others but um, there are ways that we know that pretty quickly we could uh, screen. Uh, we could use the NIAAA questions or the single questions if you've ever had more than four or more than five drinks at a time if you're a um, woman or a man. Um, and you can go by that. You can use the craft for adolescents. Um, NIAAA put out a very large, um, is there, I don't think there's a, is that it? Yeah, Oops, but it doesn't really, it's very slow. Well, anyway. That'll drive me crazy. But anyway, um, NIAAA put out a great thing here for, for youths. It's a little difficult, but basically it's either that um, you don't use what you reinforce, you are a risky drinker, or you're with somebody who you're friends and you talk about that, or obviously you are high risk and you are referred. There is the ASSIST um, program, which to me is much more of a assessment tool than really a screening tool, not that anyone could use in real life. Um, there's also the NIDA, I just put all that together in a modified assist. There's the audit, which again for uh, many sites could use this. Um, I think it's very hard in AD unless you do it under kiosk or some other uh, format. We certainly use it in our research protocols. Um, it's difficult, it's 10 questions and you have to score it, but it's available. And there's the brief desk, which isn't so brief, it's like 10 questions and it's very difficult and I don't think that you'd get that through your colleagues in emergency medicine to ask 10 questions. Um, so drugs are, are more difficult to screen for. We don't have any great questions and I'm glad that there are some people who are going to be studying it. Because the one question that we've been taught is in the past 12 months, how have you used drugs other than those required for medical reasons or for just for reasons of getting high? Um, we found in a recent study that we just completed with looking for opiate addiction, 
um, that it was difficult to ask these questions and we often had to probe further and if people were on opiates, we asked them, have you ever had to refill your prescriptions earlier than you thought you could? How long have you been taking it? Um, ever taken more than you prescribed? How do you take it? And have you ever been concerned about misuse? So it's really difficult to find one or two questions. And many times the a practitioner would say, oh, they all screened um, negative. This person does take it for something else. And then um, in this case, an RA would come up and talk to the patient, in fact, they were um, not using it as prescribed. So it's really difficult. It would be nice if we could come up with one or two questions that we can validate, but right now that's not true. Um, and we don't really have any other ways of doing pharmac uh, during urine screens or anything like that because at least in alcohol, you know that if you drink, that's what it is. It's your blood alcohol level. It's your saliva testing. It's your breathalyzer. But obviously, if you're using drugs, that may not necessarily be related to that particular instance. Um, and so it's much more complicated uh, to know whether that's related to this event or this use today. So more to come about that. Um, we know that the brief inter uh, negotiation interview does work. I'm just going to, for those of you who have not heard it before, I'll just give you a brief overlay. There are four components. The first is just to raise the subject and to just ask permission to uh, talk about whatever it is that you want to talk about, the alcohol or the drugs. Um, the other thing is to provide feedback, and that's to review whatever you know about the patient's alcohol or drug use, however you got that information, to ask them if um, there is, if they see any connection at all between um, their use and their visit today or their impaired judgment or their injury or whatever it else is because we know that that does um, improve patients' willingness to talk and motivation. In terms of enhancing motivation, we often ask them a question uh, that says their readiness to change in a scale of 1 to 10, how ready are you to change, whatever it is, cut back, enroll in a program, if they're dependent, however you feel. The whole reason for this is just to open up the discussion. All right, that's the whole reason for this. So once you say it, they give you a number, and then you say, why don't you pick a lower number? So if they say, maybe I'm a three, and you say, oh, great, you're 30% ready to change. Give me some reasons why you didn't choose a lower number. So there must be some reasons. And I have listened to, I don't know, over 700 tapes in this and a variety of different studies and people come right to this answer, you would be really, really shocked at how quickly people say stuff. Whether it's I don't want to end up like my father, I don't want to end up here again because I broke my arm or something else, I've just yelled at my grandmother, there's a million of questions and they will come out right way. And that way you can start the conversation, well that sounds like not a great thing, tell me more about that. So that allows you to start it. Uh, you, it's not wrong to say, why don't you use a higher number, except why do you care why they like to do it, all right? And it will just take you longer to get through the conversation. So it, you can, it's, there's nothing wrong with it. It's just that we found that you can really get to the quick of things if you want to ask them what are some reasons to change why they didn't pick a lower number. Then once you do that, you negotiate a change. Okay, well, we've talked about these things you said. You don't want to spend so much money. You don't want to yell at your girlfriend. You don't want to get in another car crash. Okay, there's always great reasons. Um, what can we, um, what, do you, what, what do you think is a great um, amount to drink or what do you think about your use? You come up with something that they want. Remember, the object is not to make them come up with the answer, but to reiterate what they say. Um, and then to summarize it, and you can write it down, you can write it in a script, you can do whatever you want because people think it's much more um, validated if you say something or write something to them as you would any other script, and then you thank them for their time. And we have uh, published this, we have seen it a million times, we can do this in average about seven minutes, which is not long. Considering that we have patients in the ED for four to 10 hours, I think you could get to this, all right? I just met um, at one of the other national meetings, CBDD, somebody from South Africa, Cape Town. Their patients wait three days in the emergency department. And at first people were saying to me, well, we can't do that. Our patients, are we, the, the flow is so terrible. They're in, there, they're in there for hours. We have them in the waiting room. I said, oh, great, just do it in the waiting room. And so these women, anyway, are doing it in the waiting room. And they can actually come back and do boosters because they're there two days later. <laughs> so it's really amazing. So the longer your wait, the more opportunity that you have wherever you are. Now the evidence, I could go on for a whole hour on this. Um, 
but there's pretty strong evidence that Esper works in the primary care settings. There's less consistent er, um, data on inpatient medical patients, um, but the, and there is pretty good evidence, and there may be more in the trauma setting. Um, in the ED setting, Havard uh, in 2008 reported that we had a significant reduction, um, not a significant reduction in the actual consumption, but there was associated reduction in alcohol-related injuries. We know that through these studies there have been differences in heterogeneity across in how people describe this, that, and the other, and that there are certain factors that are associated with problems. I think we've collected most of our problems and now that new data is coming out better. So I think that we're in a pretty good um, framework to say that we have very great emerging data. I'll give you a little bit. It's not meant for you to read all these, but this is the historical view of alcohol studies in the emergency department and why some of them the big negative ones and some are positive. Newman was from Germany. He's actually a, a anesthesiologist who was one of the first positive studies that he did um, as a computerized study. Blow came out with some positive results. Um, and then we had some negative results. Myself and Dapen from Switzerland pretty much did the exact same study and came out with negative results. Uh, those of us who worked in academic EM, although it was not a randomized control, quasi-experimental, we had some positive results. And Monty had some positive results in young adults. We figured out that there were some problems, so uh, Havard then came through and did his um, meta-analysis. And then Walton with our friend here. Uh, Dr. Cunningham uh, looked at um, a randomized controlled telephone, computerized um, interventions, and therapists doing uh, interventions for violence and alcohol, and did find out that the therapists resulted in decrease in self-reported aggression and alcohol consequences. And then I was able to, and the NIAAA was very helpful and gave me more money because I kind of made some mistakes in the first study. We realized what we had done wrong. Uh, one, we weren't putting people in that were consistently drinking over certain levels, um, which we needed to do. We really had to have control groups. We really needed to limit the amount of assessments. And unfortunately, when you, there's a double-edged sword for the NI, triple, any NIH study, and that's that they want you to have 50 million measurements. And every time you do that, you're just studying them, and that's not normal. So we really, really briefly said we were just going to do this very tiny assessment, and even in one group we didn't do anything else except enroll them. And then we were able to find a difference between our groups, and we were really happy. We did not find any significantly difference between those that had a booster and those that were just given the intervention by existing staff in the ED. No extra people. All of my staff did it. So other doctors, residents, uh, mid-levels, and that also, besides their consumption, we were able to show that they uh, had less episodes of drinking and driving um, after more than three or more drinks. So we know that um, that's pretty exciting. We know that there have been some cohorts of studies that have been done that have showed that we can refer patients to um, addiction services and that they do enroll in those addiction services, and so that's good news. Um, and drugs, although we have less studies, they've been all positive, actually. Um, Dr. Bernstein is here, and, and Judith Bernstein did a lot of this work um, as early as 2005 in urgent care, showed some results, uh, and then in a pediatric ED uh, population with marijuana use. Um, Madras looked at um, a bunch of different studies at six months, um, and the WHO, and Willard um, recently had presented some positive studies on looking at use, but not in, in consequences. So we do have some, some emerging data coming out of there. There are current studies that are going on right now that were all RFAs um, that were released about five or six years ago. And we are all in the process right now of collecting our data. And um, I'll have my data for SAM, but I can tell you our study is looking very good at the one month. We just finished um, enrolling uh, in June, and our primary, uh, one of our primary outcomes is engagement and treatment in six, it, one month, and that looks very good. So I'll be presenting that, and I'm excited. Um, Dr. Balkin Schultz did uh, the NIDA study, Clinical Trials Network, that looked at all different types of drugs. We're still waiting to hear from them. They have concluded their study. And so we should see soon. In the tobacco realm, these are mostly done by Steve Bernstein at Yale. Um, he finished enrolling in his treatment low-income 
smokers in a hospital department setting, does that work? And he used starting uh, with nicotine patches, and he's going to be reporting on that, and that's going to be good news. And he just started another study looking from NHL, NHLBI, looking at implementation of a health IT enhanced tobacco treatment for hospitalized smokers. That just got started. So that's good. So summing this up, where are we right now? We need to adopt it. We know that there's enough here that we need to do something. Um, and this is our website. If anybody wants to look on it, you may download or use anything there. It's all free. Um, we have everything there from videos to uh, case studies in different areas um, to articles that we keep putting on there. It's a dynamic website. You can use it whatever you want. We were fortunate to have a SAMHSA grant, and we did um, uh, train all of these, uh, all of our residents in all of five specialties at Yale. Um, Seventeen centers were funded, so a lot of people have learned about SBRT. Uh, we've trained over 600 residents so far, but the most important part is that we integrated into everybody's um, curriculum at this time. So whether it was med peds or pediatrics or EM or psychiatry, OBGYN, um, and internal medicine, which is huge. Um, it's all integrated in their system. The grant is over. Um, we have a no-cost extension out just to do data stuff, but it's done and we're continuing. And this year we did it like every other year before, so that's pretty exciting. What are some elements of success? Why we, I think, have had a good experience. Um, when we go back and ask people, we have laminated cards. People can keep them in their pocket. They can learn them. We can now put them on their PDAs if they want. We don't have to have them even in their pocket. Um, and uh, they like the one-to-one -one interaction that they get. And the residency directors loved it, too, because the new ACGMA guidelines of core competencies, we can put it into that, and it fulfills some of that criteria. And the residents said, boy, I've never had anybody really listen to me do anything or sit down and talk to me. So they were very excited about it. Um, we have a lot of resources available, and that you have to hope that you can get them. But we have Project Assert as um, Boston Medical Center. So we have people who are available to help the, those patients who are in more severe uh, end of the spectrum get into treatment, because that's really important. And then we have are capable of doing interventions with everybody short of that. We did integrate into clinical practice, but we just went to Epic in February, so I'm back to square one. <laughs> but in our previous integrated model, um, this was in the uh, adolescent clinic. We integrated the craft into their model, so they just picked it up and answered it, and then they were prompted when it was positive to do a BNI. I'm not going to say too much about new technologies because you're going to get a whole talk on that, but there have been people who have been doing this by web-based and all kinds of things. Dr. Federico Vaca in my institution has taken the uh, BNI and um, incorporated it into this CASI format in Spanish, and that's been doing very well by um, feasibility studies. Um, and we have developed and are sort of enhancing this right now a computerized online coach because it's very difficult and time consuming to teach this. I know that it is. So that um, people may be able to use this um, to help with their practitioners. And it's a very sophisticated coach. It um, gives certain amount of uh, responses. And you can choose one. And the good part about this is it doesn't remember what you said. So <laughs> as you all know, we have to do all these tests in the hospital constantly. And everybody knows what they do. They just go through and take it, get the answers wrong, memorize which ones, go back and take it again. Right? These questions change, and the answers change every time you do it so that it learns from you. And so that at first, you might say something that is a little obnoxious, but horribly obnoxious. And so Coach Bixie might say, I, you know, that's maybe you should try again. But if you do the same thing again, she'll cut you off so the patient will say, I'm not going to talk to you anymore. So it learns. It's a very sophisticated algorithm. And it learns um, what you say to it. And it keeps track of it um, as you go through. So it's, it's kind of cool. But in the end, we feel that, and I think most of us feel that, the, clearly the emergency department broadens the base and offers opportunities. There is evidence that ED expert is emerging, does reduce alcohol and drug use. We can link substance use disorders to specialized treatment. We can reduce negative consequences, and we can reduce health care costs. We are often the only access to care that people have. But whatever we do, we have to make sure that we can be feasible and sustainable so that everybody can use it, which I think is a real goal of mine. 
and that's it. So the pieces are kind of coming together. They're not totally there. There are a lot of things going on, and that's it. We have, we, have quick, yeah. we have time for a few questions. If anyone has any for Gail. I'm not tall enough to see. I'm sorry. It's a view over there. I actually have a question. Is Coach Vicky available if folks here yet, are interested no. in I'm using sorry. it? I'm sorry. Right. It may be soon, but it's, uh, it's still in a prototype, and we've almost got the first one, and we could certainly do that when we get it done. It's almost done. Yeah. It's, it required a it, I just can't tell you how much money went into that and how many systems engineers I've gone through to develop this, but once it's done, and that's just one scenario, and to do more, I need some more money. <laughs> Feds aren't here. <laughs> Other questions for Gail? Can, can you come, sorry, I'm sorry, can you come to the microphone just because it's being taped? Thank you. Thanks, Gail. Chris Dunn, C uh, University of Washington in Seattle. Can you share that interactive talk trainer that you just showed in the near next to the last slide? Uh, is, shortly. Is it? Okay. I could share, shortly. I'm trying to get it, so it's on like this special kind of machine right now, and I'm trying to yeah. figure out. So it's, it's not web ready. Not right yet, but that's okay. when I'm making it right okay. now. We'll pay for it. <laughs> You'll pay for it. Wow, that no, would be great. No, yeah. <laughs> no, I, you, don't, you don't have to pay me for it. I mean, I just, it, it's hard for me to get the money to do it, so I've been doing it in fits and starts for the, because I have to pay these engineers and whatever who are constantly working on it. But once it's done, anybody could have it. I'm, Fantastic. I'm not at trying to make money off it. No, yeah, thanks. I, I will say that um, Katya is signaling that they do have some resources um, through the Blending Initiative for folks that are interested in learning how to do SBIRT. And Gail's website also, um, her Yale SBIRT website also has some really nice training videos um, for anyone that's interested in learning more about how to do these brief interventions while you're in kind of the process of sewing someone up. It's yeah, a great you, and time you can to, you know, take anything your, off of there. You can do yeah. the laminated card right from there and laminate or just put it, take it down, and you can use whatever you like. Okay. Hi. Oh, sorry. Scott Weiner from Tufts. Hi. Thank Hi. you. Um, do people respond differently when they're interacting with a computer or a physician or an RA or paper? Have you, do you know of any student, uh, student studies that look at the differences? Um, there are a few, but not, not a whole lot. And uh, there are some studies that have done well with uh, IT and maybe, are you going to talk about, uh, I'll, let, I'll let our next speaker talk about that, Rebecca. But um, the one thing that we found that was a little bit of difference, because we always talk about that people are pretty straightforward when they, uh, when you ask them how much they drink, is that uh, a side thing that happened to us in our study was that uh, patients uh, were given a health quiz initially and said something. Afterwards, as part of the study, they said it in a, um, in a voice response system. And when they gave their answers in the voice response system, they were 1.5 drinks higher than they would to the person, which was kind of unusual from previous work. So they might be a little less likely than that. But some people like it. Dr. Vaca's studies have shown that the patients um, have liked and, and responded to his treatment. They weren't randomized control studies. They were feasibility studies, but that they um, enjoyed listening to them. And they're, um, they're kind of have these big uh, uh, things they stick on their ears and stuff so that no one can hear them and they can touch so that it's very private even if you're out in the hallway. But I'll let Rebecca talk about it. Hi, Jason Hoppy from Colorado. I don't know if it's a philosophical thing, but have you looked at, it just seems that you're screening so many patients and um, it's like, I, I feel like, um, maybe I'm wrong, but is this information actually going to the providers as they make their decision, or is this a completely separate process? Because we've talked about the lack of screening that we have and, and that there's so much information being gained. I'm interested to know if that's actually affecting outcomes as far as prescribing. And, and are we going beyond screening them? Is it well, in my studies, separate? yes, the providers um, were the ones who did all the interventions, so they knew. Um, and in the real life, in my ED, the providers um, get any information regardless who did this screening, whether it was the nurse or whatever. And I think, again, Dr. Cunningham will probably talk about some IT things where that it's fed back to the provider um, so that it's really important. And, and with Epic, when I finally figure it out, because everybody's so stressed over everything else that's in there, um, that it will be pretty easy to make sure people understand what's going on. 
Yeah, no, I understand the Epic stuff. We have that too. I guess I just I wonder about how I, maybe how it's delivered because we get a lot of alerts in Epic and you get alert fatigue and things like that. And where where that fits in the process of decision making, is it popping up before you write your prescription electronically? Is it information that's given up front? And then how do we deal with that? I guess it's very interesting to me. Yeah, and that's a great that's a great another study we've been trying to get that funded too. But anyway, <laughs> about how those pop ups occur and how you're right and how you prescribe and stuff. It's there's a lot of opportunity, and it could happen. Uh, I'm just uh, really shocked by so many times people will come to me, and those, it might be a nurse, it might be one of my project assert workers who tell me something about a patient that nobody else told me, like the resident didn't tell me, or I never would have dreamed of this issue, and it really was the whole crux of the being there. It was the whole reason that they were there. So, well, you want to get all that information from as many providers as you can because it's it's sometimes quite shocking what people will come up with and you say, oh, they never even screened this person, the resident, and oh my goodness, it's the whole reason they're there. And uh, I've had I've come in from nights where people have CT'd the heck out of patients, towed ahead about problems and thoracic dissections and all this and then I really go in and the, really the problem is um, a lot of opiate use um, since a prior surgery and this is really why I fainted and this is really what my problem is and oh my god they missed it totally so let's wait. Um, I'm Isabel Barada from New York. Thank you for your presentation and most for your research because it's really outstanding. Um, I do have a question about the integration of the residency programs. I know you said it's on the website. Is it published because there's such a drive to bring this into the emergency medicine program? So yes. Um, well, the, we, there's a whole issue in substance um, abuse last fall. The entire issue is on curriculum for screening and brief intervention. We have two papers there, one an overall description of all this, and then a pediatric one, how we um, kind of adapted it to the pediatric uh, curriculum. Uh, we also have, I have a paper in academic emergency medicine, I can't remember, mid 200 somewhere that talks about uh, teaching all the practitioners of how to do it. And then we have another paper just in the last year that came out, Mike Pantalon did that talks about the critical action sheets and um, validated the training. Uh, what last question, and then we're going to move on to our next uh, panelist. That figure of 25 million addicts is that just narcotics or is that alcohol? That's everything. That's substance use. But just to repeat the question was: Is that figure of 25 million addicts everything or just narcotics? That's everything substance use. All right. Thank you, Gail. That's great. All right. And